Brandon Henright. This is Advanced Windows Malware Detection and Removal. Um, so this is a three hour PDS. And this session is really for you guys. I've put together about two hours of actual material to work on VMs and um, for the first hour plus questions plus anything that comes up and anything you guys want to see. Um, I'm gonna try to video record this. I know that in the past people have wanted documentation and it's difficult for me to do useful documentation that isn't too detailed. Um, so I'm going to videotape this intro session and I'll, I'll probably put it up on YouTube or um, maybe give a link out to the, the raw video to folks. I have everyone's email address um, and also I have the VMs for this session, the next session, and all the previous year's PDSs already online. Um, so in the past I've had trouble hosting them. but this year I'm just hosting it myself and I'll send everyone a link and you can download whatever content you want. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to start out. <coughs> I'll break the classroom. Um, this session is about detecting and removing malware on Windows machines. Now, I assume everyone, uh, so I work for Cisco. I used to work for UC San Diego. I worked there for eight some odd years. And so I'm pretty familiar with the challenges that universities face. And we have anywhere between 100 and 20,000 students living on campus and they all manage their own machines. Um, and whether or not it's your policy that they run antivirus and keep their machines up to date and turn on fire and that sort of thing. We all know the reality is, is that they're, they're going to do whatever the heck they want. Um, and when you tell them, you know, don't browse to shady stuff or, or, or whatever, it's just, just no stopping them. And so you get this constant influx of compromised machines, and you don't have the resources to re-image those machines. You don't have the OEM product key CDs. You don't have the resources necessarily to back up their machines. It, it's just not usually possible. And so hopefully in, in this session is because you're coming to the session because you're interested in being able to look at the machine, figure out, does this have malware on it or not? If so, is it, is it reasonably easy to remove this malware? Um, and if so, do it uh, so that you can reduce the number of times you have to tell the student, sorry, you know, you're going to have to reinstall your machine, or you know, the, the number of times you get stuck or, or waste a bunch of uh, employee resource time uh, trying to fix people's machines. If I, I've recognized a number of faces that have been in my PDS sessions in the past. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack this year. In this session in past years, I did a combination of two things. I installed as much malware on a machine as I possibly could, and I also broke Windows as best I possibly could. And then the session was all about removing the malware and then fixing Windows. And I always try to break Windows in ways that you would see, you would likely see from customers bringing their machines in. That was a little bit more applicable to the Windows XP days. I think you probably run into Windows 7 broken less, or when it is broken, it's in a different or possibly less severe way. Um, and two, you probably run into really, really severe malware less. Um, at least that's my perception, that, that you see a lot of malware, but it's not necessarily as crazy. So in this session, I want, I want to spend some time on the whiteboard talking about some of the fundamental ideas behind how processes and, and how the Windows operating system works. And then I'm going to spend some time on, a project, on, on, on the projector going through Windows, showing Process Explorer, showing processes and threads and DLLs and, and essentially the fundamentals of Windows. And then we'll fire up uh, the <coughs> VM that I made for this session, and then we'll work through actually working out that VM and removing the malware. And um, I didn't break Windows on this VM, so if Windows gets broken, it gets broken during the cleaning process, um, which I've cleaned this VM several times, and a couple of the times I ended up breaking Windows in the process of cleaning it, so, which is a somewhat realistic, uh, somewhat realistic scenario. So I understand that not everyone has a great vision and that this whiteboard is hard to see, so um, please, let me, please come up as close as you want, and if you have any questions, you can't read what I'm going to write, then, you know, let me know. Also, this really, this session is for you guys, so I don't not, don't have lecture notes or anything like that. Um, 
so if you have questions or if you want to see something on covered on windows or if you want some specific details um, elucidated then let me know so i think everyone has seen an executable file you know um svc host dot exe I figure few people have probably actually looked at the actual structure of an executable file, but I think it's a little bit useful to understand how an executable works. So at the start of every executable, there's this little header, and Microsoft calls this a stub header. It starts with MZ. MZ stands is the initials of the guy at Microsoft that back in the early or, or maybe late 80s, early 90s, um, designed the MS DOS executable format. And so, in Windows, in, in a modern 64-bit Windows executable, Microsoft still has a teeny tiny little DOS stub executable. All this executable does is print something like this program um, cannot be run in DOS mode or something like that. So it has this MZ stub, has some additional information right here that DOS will just skip over, that the Windows loader knows um, points to an offset, and then there's an actual PE header. PE stands for Portable Executable. This is essentially the start of the, the Windows executable. Oh, by the way, I don't, I don't know if you guys necessarily need to write this down or take notes. I am videoing this. I don't know how long my camera's battery's gonna last, but it'll definitely last long enough for this. So even if we don't get the entire session, I'm at least going to have the intro um, online. Okay, so the PE header <coughs> contains a bunch of information about the executable. You know how big it is, how many sections it has, what machines it can run on. You know, is it is it a 32-bit um, executable or 64-bit executable? Is it compiled to native code or is it a .NET executable? It contains a bunch of information. Actually. I'm simplifying this a little bit. There's PE header and there's a PE, th PE plus or um, PE. Well, the, the plus is the 64-bit and the the, um, the .NET, but all that means is it adds a little additional little like extended header at the bottom here. A portable executable a PE file has a number of sections, and the first one is typically. You can name them whatever you want. They have eight, up to eight character names, but they typically start with a period, and the first one is usually dot .text. Now, I know it's pretty confusing, but um, text does not mean like readable text. Text means executable code. Um, just blame some computer scientists from the 70s for that. Um, and then it has additional headers. Um, so this this would, if it, if you see a dot text or a dot code section that means it's the executable code, and then there's a, a section such as um, dot bss dot data dot reloc. My handwriting is terrible. I'm sorry, but the, the point is is that an executable contains a bunch of the sections. Some of them are executable code. Some of them are information about functions that the, the executable will import or export. It'll contain um, icon information or if the executable has like images and that sort of thing embedded. You put those in additional sections <coughs> and you keep them separate from the executable code. And then when you double click on this file, oh, you know, it might have like an SSL certificate signing the uh, 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 cert down here that might like sign all, sign all of the executable. When you double click on this executable, Windows literally takes the executable and it expands it out into memory in the way that it's laid out on disk. So if this is memory address 0000, zero, zero, zero you know, hex, and then this is memory address 0xf, you know, high memory address, low memory address. Um, <coughs> the header gets put in here, you know, you see MZ. It literally just expands the executable as it was on disk, literally right into memory. It does very little translation. Um, the text section, or each one of these sections has a base address. And it's typically something like 0x4, and then all zeros would be the, the, the typical base address for a text section. And so that will, this section will get put at 0x4, You'll see the text section. 
and then you have the additional sections. Um, it, it's a little bit more complicated than this. So this is the one executable, but each, almost every executable that's dynamically linked, which described almost every executable in Windows, has a bunch of DLLs, essentially libraries. DLL stands for Digital Link Library, that it will also import. And a DLL is also an executable. There's no difference between a DLL and a .exe file. The same goes with .sys files, .scr files, .com files, pretty much any executable file all has this exact format. And the only thing that makes, the only difference between a DLL and an executable is this little bit set in the header that is essentially, this is a DLL one, you know, and it's set, now it's a DLL. Um, and so you can convert an executable to a DLL or a DLL to an executable by changing a bit. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna run um, when you double click on it because there's some additional information like the entry point. So where do you start executing when you double click on this? And the thing with DLLs is that there's multiple locations you can start executing and with an executable there's only one. It's called the entry point. So when you double click on this and there's some import table, dot import, can you spell that? Um, so Windows will take some additional information, some DLLs, and it will also load those into memory. So if we have, you know, DLL1, DLL2, so on and so forth. And, you know, and these start with MZ. And it will load those into memory too. And so you'll you'll have in, in this memory range, you'll also have, you know, an additional DLL right here, an additional text section. And they're all sharing the same address space, you know. So this DLL, if they were executing, could access this memory, and you know, this executable could access this DLL. Um, I mean, that's the whole point. That you know, as the executable is running, it can make use of functions inside this DLL by just jumping into their memory because they're all sharing the same address space. Um, and so <coughs> the only trick, the o the only trick to this is that if you have an executable whose dot text section has a has a base address of, of 40000 and you have a DLL that also has a dot text section with a base address of 0x400, you know, then you would get a, essentially a collision. They wouldn't be able to be loaded into the same process at the same time um, because they'd be trying to be occupied with the same memory addresses. And so Windows has a function that calls a relocation. It's able to relocate or rebase the DLL. And it uses the reloc table for that. But um, this DLL, it'll go, well, I want to go load it at such and such memory address, but that memory is already allocated, so I'm going to have to change the base address and move it down and relocate it in memory. And almost every DLL that gets compiled is, is capable of being relocated. So this doesn't really cause any problems, but I bring it up because we're going to see it a little bit later. Um, doing this relocation takes time. So when you double click or when you load this DLL, the, process, the processor has to sort of compute all, recompute all of these tables, all of these offsets, all of the jumps um, to handle the relocation. And that takes time. And so Microsoft, when they are compiling all of their executables and all their DLLs, there's a lot of memory available. And so they change the, the table so that they don't really get any collisions. So they don't really get any conflict. So almost any Microsoft executable with any Microsoft DLL, they've already laid it out so that they all have different base addresses so that you don't get any collisions. And that's, they do that to save time so that when you're running Windows shift executables or, or, or you're using Windows shift DLLs, you're not going to get any memory collisions. Um, They'll change them by service pack. So service pack, you know, zero will have one set. Service pack one will have a different set. Service pack two will have a different set. Um, and most, you really have to know what you're doing when you're programming these things or when you're compiling these things to actually change the base offset. And so if you're a third-party maker, um, WinZip or WinRAR or pretty much any software, and you're making a DLL that sits in other processes, address spaces. You're just going to compile it and you're going to get the default base address. And so when your DLL gets loaded into memory, you're going to have to get relocated. And so you'll see in Processes Explorer, when you actually look at the DLLs that are loaded into the processes, you'll see like almost all of the relocated DLLs are stuff that have been added by third parties that are not Microsoft that have been added after the fact. And so it's one of the telltale signs that this, is, uh, this has been added after the fact. And it's one of the reasons why Processes Explorer even bought us to show that to you. Now, 
<clears throat> I want to make two more points about the why I drew this all out, because this probably doesn't look very pertinent. Um, point one is that when you double click on an executable, you sort of think of it as one thing running. But in reality, you have one set of address space. You could have as many things in this address space running that you want. And so when you double click on this, and you know your executable goes into this .text section, you could have the processor executing some code here, call it thread one. And you could have some code and in some other executable, or you know some other DLL, or some other section in here executing too. So we'll say that that's also executing. <coughs> Call that thread number two. And really, you can have as many threads executing inside of one process that you want. Um, there's really essentially no limit. And the reason this is important is that when you're looking at Task Manager, and Task Manager is showing you the things that are running on your machine, it tells you by process, because the, the, the idea, the, the design idea, is that all of the things that are, all of the threads that are running within the executable are related to the executable. That, that's the design goal. Malware authors never follow the design goal. Malware authors are always looking to break the rules in any way that they possibly can. So. When you're looking and you see, oh, SVC host.exe is running, or process explorer.exe is running, or explorer.exe, or Internet Explorer, or Firefox, or whatever.exe is running, you sort of assume that everything that's running inside of that process is all related to Firefox or all related to Process Explorer. And that doesn't have to be true. Um, there's a, util a, a function or a feature within Windows. Um, so you have some, let's call this SVC host.exe, and it's, it's running some service in Windows. And you double click on some other malware over here. We'll just, I'll just draw it out. You double click on some other malware. You know, and it, it, its little text section gets run, and the first thing it does is it enumerates, show me all of the processes running on this system. And then it says, now show me all of the threads running in these processes. Oh, well, you know, or all the DLLs. Well, I'm not running inside this process, so let me take myself and I'm gonna stick myself into this process. <coughs> and I'm going, so the stick myself in this process, this, this sort of hijacking, it's sort of, um, it's sort of like biting it and turning it into a zombie. Um, that is the load library function. So you say load this library into this process. Uh, so in Windows it would be like load library A, or load A stands for ASCII, so you give it an ASCII path and it'll load that library. Um, so you can stick yourself in this process, load library. And then you can say now execute a new thread right here, and that's called create remote thread. And so instead of creating a thread, a spawning thread inside of yourself, you can spawn a thread inside of a different process and you can tell it an arbitrary location to start running. And so almost all modern malware makes use of this. You know, the malware exists as a DLL, or the malware exists as an executable and some injectable code that it can put into another process. And the, one of the reasons for this is that the, the Windows security model and most security products are process-centric. So when you look at the Windows firewall, you can make exceptions by executable. You're not making exceptions by thread. So if you allow explorer.exe or internet explorer.exe to access the internet, and that you know that doesn't give you any warnings, it, you know just you don't want your firewall to warn you of that. So if you're a malware, a piece of malware, and you know that Internet Explorer is whitelisted, then you go and inject yourself in Internet Explorer. You do a create remote thread. Now you've hijacked Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is still doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. You just have something additional running. Now whenever you go and reach out the internet. And the firewall says, well, what process is doing this? Oh, Internet Explorer is doing this. I'm, not, I'm just going to allow this. Um, and so it's, it's a way to get around whitelisted processes for inside of like antivirus products. It's a way to get around firewalls. Um, it's a way to get around all sorts of stuff. Plus, when you look in Task Manager and you see these processes running, you don't, you don't see malware.exe running. You just see Internet Explorer or Firefox or you know whatever process has been hijacked. 
And then point number two I want to make about this <coughs> is that, as I said, when you double click on an executable, that executable just gets expanded out into memory, essentially totally unchanged. That doesn't mean that the executable can't change itself. So the first thing you could do, you can imagine, well, you can imagine like a, a self-extracting self -extracting zip file, for example. So if you've ever turned a zip file into a .exe, how does that work? I mean, how does, like an, how does a zip file decompress itself? Well, the way it works is you take a zip file, and you put an executable up in front of it. And when you don't click on that executable, Windows just says, well, I have this executable in this zip file. And it doesn't know what this zip file is. It just puts all that into memory. And then the executable says, OK, it's been programmed to be, I'm a self-extracting zip file. So I'm going to read my own memory, search for the start of a zip file, and I have a decompression routine. And I'm going to extract the zip file and put files on disk. So it's essentially an executable that gets shipped along with a little like appendage that it, that it knows to decompress. And malware authors have used have exploited this fact because when you, an antivirus program goes and scans an executable, you know it looks at the, the different sections, and that's how it tries to determine whether or not this whether or not this is malware. So you can write a. I'm going to erase There it is. Jillion ways to do it, and now our authors have come up with some incredibly creative things to do. Um, but you can write a executable that has sort of this really big text section. Well, really big. It's actually small, but but really big in terms of it seems to contain a lot more than it needs to contain. Um, and that is essentially you have this you have this part at the top. It's all part of the text section. It is actual executable code. I know it's hard to read, but you have some actual executable code. You double click on this, and it all gets put into memory. <coughs> so you have your MZ header, you have your PE, and you have your dot. And the first thing that this thing does when it starts executing is it reads its own memory and goes, I'm going to decompress or decrypt or both myself. And I'm going to expand myself out. And so it expands out new code that was, you know, this is essentially like compressed or encrypted code. And this is a little decomp decompression stub handler that reads itself and decompresses itself into memory. And so what you get in memory is different than what you had on disk. In fact, sometimes it will decompress an entire new MZP header. It will decompress like an entire new header and put it in the memory. <coughs> and so if you, look at, if you look at the structure of the executable in memory and you compare it to the structure of the executable in disk, they don't match. Um, and this is called hacker. Or, well, doing this to an executable is, is, said, is the executable is said to be packed or it's said to be cryptid. But typically the term is packed. And the utility that will go and do this for you is called Packer. Uh, I think the most common Packer is um, UPX, uh, um, stands for Universal Packer for Executables. It runs on a bunch of different operating systems, and malware authors like it a lot. But malware authors will, they've created just thousands of different Packers. I mean, there's FSG, there's ASPAC, there's ASCrypt, there's ASProtect, there's um, Armadillo, uh, VMProtect, UPX. There's just a gajillion of them. And the reason for that is, is that when you're an antivirus program and you're scanning this code, you see a little decompression stuff. You don't really see any of the malicious code because it's all compressed or encrypted or both. Um, 
And so you know, the, the juicy stuff that says I'm a bad executable, you know, the one that does the network sockets, the, the one that you know opens the, the files, you know, the, all the stuff that all the bad stuff is all sort of obfuscated in some way. And it's only when it gets loaded into memory. And since antivirus programs have traditionally been file on disk based, where they scan your hard drive, it's completely bypasses antivirus programs. And so the only hope that an antivirus program has for detecting this, unless it's already running on your machine. You know, the whole goal of antivirus is to prevent it from running on your machine. Um, their only recourse is to either identify the actual stub decryptor, and they can't really do that because legitimate software uses packers all the time. Or they can just make a signature for this encrypted stuff, um, saying, you know, well, if it matches this exactly, then we know it's bad. But that doesn't help because if you have like a key-based system where you just change the key and then all of this changes, then you get a write around that. So um, this technique was invented, I don't know, maybe in the mid-90s. And it has rendered antivirus almost completely useless. Um, because the bad guys have the advantage here. They can change this however they want, and an antivirus program has to try to has to try to figure out whether or not it's good or bad. Um, and so the trick the trick that most antivirus software is, has used in recent years is what they call heuristics, which really just means guessing. Um, they will they will look at an executable and they will say, um, I mean, there are literally tons of antivirus, antivirus products do this. They look at an executable, they say, this doesn't contain enough executable code to be a useful executable, but if I look at the size, I see some additional stuff. So basically they have some additional stuff recognition. I don't recognize what this additional stuff is, so it's probably bad. And so if you submit a bunch of executables to virus total, you'll see something like heuristic.pack. They're not telling you it's a virus. They're just saying, you know, it's probably packed, so it's probably bad. And um, or you know, generic dot cryptor. And so almost a huge amount of the antivirus detection these days is not detection of the payload, it's a detection of the packer itself. And so you'll see, like, if you ever see Anna Maurer named, like, uh, Cryptic, K-R-Y-P-T-I-C, Cryptic, it's just looking at the packer. It doesn't tell you anything about the executable itself. Because the, the bad guys that write the packers are good at writing packers. The bad guys that write the malware are good at writing malware, and they're, they're usually separate groups. And so the bad, they have got, a, you know, sort of a business model going where, I specialize in writing packers, I special, you know, someone else specializes in writing malware. We get together, my packer packs your malware. Um, and so that means that there's a lot of bad guys' packers get reused across large amounts of malware. And so writing a detector for the packer is sort of the, the reasonable thing to do from an antivirus company's perspective. Unfortunately, you know, if I pack an info stealer with such and such packer versus packing you know, just stupid like click bot, advertising bot. Like get detected is the same thing. So your universe program will tell you, I have, you know, cryptic, cryptic, and they're completely different malware with totally different functionality. One steals your bank account number, and the other one, you know, does some advertisement fraud. Um, or worse, the universe company will look at the one sample. They'll look at the advertising bot. They'll say, well, we're gonna we're gonna create some signature. They're actually creating a signature for the packer. But they're calling it. They're not saying they're not saying I, this malware is a packer. You know, they're not giving it a generic packer name. They're saying this is a click fraud bot or advertising fraud or, or, or a fake AV or whatever. But in reality, you take that packer, you pack something really bad with it, an info stealer, you know, some bank account stealing thing, and then you have that on your machine, and it tells you it's fake AV. Um, and so this is this has made antivirus detection or at least the names that antivirus gives things, completely unreliable. Um, when it tells you you have an info stealer, you may or may not have one, because it, that info stealer may have shared a packer with some other um, program. Um, or if it tells you, you know, you have, if you have cryptic, or if you're looking at some packer generic detection, it means nothing about what the actual, actual malicious code is. Okay, does anyone have any questions or anything like that? Yes, sir. Uh, the scanning at the network level also the same, same concept? Is it still guessing packets and trying to understand what kind of signature it could possibly be? I'm not sure what you mean by scanning at the network level. Like, we have network security guys that can say, just 
machine's got a gun suits on it, this machine's got yeah. that on it. So typically the way they're doing that is based on the command and control. Are you signed up for my second session? Great. The whole second session is all about that. Um, yeah, in short, basically the as executable's running, it's it's reaching out to the bad guy's servers okay. and it's doing it over some protocol. And typically the protocol of the 21st century is HTTP. Um, and so you'll you can write signatures that match the HTTP structure. The other thing you can do is you can say, well, I know these domains are associated with Zeus, or these domains are associated with SpyI, or these domains are associated with FakeAB. Um, and then you can also do it by IP address. But IP address, you often get aliasing, because um, the bad guys, you know, usually the bad guys, are the, the people that are running, that are actually running the malware command and control infrastructure, they're not the ones who wrote the bot. They're also not the ones who wrote the packer. And so, Usually their goal is to steal information or do advertising fraud or whatever. And so they go and buy the malware from someone else. And they often don't have any particular loyalty to any particular piece of malware. And so if you try to identify by IP address, well, it turns out that those bad guys with their machine that they're running on the internet are actually running four or five different botnets out of their machine. And so you identify one as Zeus, and it turns out that they're actually the bot that you have is ad fraud, but you've identified this IP as Zeus. And so basically, when you're when you're identifying it at the IP address level, you, you have the same inaccuracy that you get with hackers. But when you're actually looking at the, the command and control traffic, then you're pretty solid. You pretty much know it's Zeus or, or a particular piece of malware. And my whole entire second session is all about that. Any other questions? So, get these lights off. And you can fire up your VM. actually going to use the um, second lab session VM for the first few minutes here because it's faster. Um, the power of VM is pretty slow because it's got a lot of power running in it. Um, so you should have a link to VMware Player on your desktop. Yeah, let me show that to you. So you should have a VMware Player link. Well, I had to install Workstation on this machine for some additional features, but run a VMware player, you're going to have to translate roughly. So you should either go to like file open, <coughs> and then on the desktop there should be a Resnet 2012 folder. And then open up the Win7 NetLab, so you should see Win7 base, open that. And then you're going to have to edit the hardware configuration slightly. So you can right click on it, and you go to settings, or you can go to like edit, I don't remember exactly what it looks like. Um, but what you want to change is you want to change the network adapter, and you want to bridge the network adapter. <coughs> the other thing you want to do is um, in the CD drive, you should have a CD um, in the use ISO image, hit browse. And in the Resnet 2012 folder, you should have the ResKit file. So again, set the networking to bridge, bridge, and set the uh, Set the CD image to. I'm behind. Okay. Let me actually look at some screen so I know what it looks like. Just wrote this. Yeah. Okay. Open up one seven base. Yeah. And then go to. Do you take ownership? Yeah. Take ownership. If it asks you to take ownership, take ownership. It's if it's it's just hit skip this version if it's asking you about a software update. <laughs> trying to upsell the VMware workstation. And then hit edit virtual machine settings once you get it opened. And then change the CD-ROM drive to the res kit in the 
present in 2012 folder, so hit browse. And then you're, it's go, you have to go to the desktop and then go to ResNet 2012, and then go to ResKit, and then change the network adapter to bridge. have trouble
should see a, a CD drive that has the forensic resource kit, forensic risk kit in it. If you don't, that means you probably either didn't choose the image <coughs> properly or you didn't connect it. Um, so if you edit your virtual machine settings um, and you go to the CD drive and you have the risk, the yeah, you have the risk kit. Make sure you check the connected box. That'll actually essentially put the disk in the drive. So this is essentially a fresh install of Windows. It doesn't have any malware or anything like that running on it. Um, so I want to spend 15 or 20 minutes uh, talking about Windows, Windows registry services, processes, um, the kernel, that sort of thing, answer any questions, and then we can actually boot some malware-infected machines, um, and we'll work on those for the second half of the session. So if you go to the res kit, um, it's in the CD drive, or should be in the CD drive. You, yes, sir. You don't have it, sir. <coughs> super, super fancy task manager. Um, and since this is Windows 7, um, when you run a program in Windows 7, essentially by default it runs a sort of a limited privilege mode. Um, and then you can use UAC and you can go to an elevated privilege mode. And so in, if you didn't, so one way to do it would be to right click on it when you open it and go to run as administrator. And then you get a UAC prompt and then you'll run in higher privilege mode. The other way to do it is just to double click on it. And then go to file, and then it's that little shield icon. It means go to high privilege mode. And then you just hit show details for all processes. And that'll restart process explorer with a UAC prompt. And you'll get it in a higher privilege <coughs> mode. So this is a default install of Windows 7. Um, it has the only thing that's installed is the VMware tools and um, I believe Wireshark. And so all of the all of the processes, all of the services that are running on this machine are more or less come standard from Microsoft. So there are 37 processes running, which is one of the reasons why Windows 7 is so darn slow and uses so many memory. Um, the pink pink processes, which I know it's hard to see on the projector. Um, Pink processes are what Process Explorer thinks are system processes. They're higher privileged processes. So it thinks that they are services. And the blue processes are the processes that are owned by your user. So if you scroll over here on the side, you'll see the username, and you'll see other dash PC backslash user. So that's the user that we're logged in as, and that's the user that we're running Process Explorer as. And so all of the processes that are running as us are shown in blue. And then all of the processes that Process Explorer thinks are privileged system processes that will show in pink. And you can see they're running as users like NT Authority System or NT Authority Local Service um, or NT Authority Network Service. Now, if you click on various different processes, you get this lower pane, lower panel here. You can have two different views for this lower panel. Um, the default one is the DLL view. And so we're looking at the DLLs, the, the, the libraries that are loaded into the processes memory address space. There's a button up here. Um, it's this yellow gear button. And when you click on that, it'll change the lower panel. So instead of showing you DLLs, it'll show you some resources. It calls them handles, but it, it's resources that the process has access to. Files that it has open, handles it has, threads and muted mutexes, and the window station uh, handle, and, and a bunch of other stuff. You don't usually look at that. You mostly look at the DLLs. Um, if you click on a process like 
SV, this is the school or service for, for printing. Then you look in the lower DLL panel, you should see some yellow processes. You should see, or yellow DLLs loaded in the memory, the TPV MW32.DLL. The yellow means that Process Explorer thinks that this DLL was relocated. So if you remember from the drawing that I did, it had some default base address, and that base address conflicted with something that was already loaded into this process, and so they got relocated. <coughs> so if you see the, the image, if you see the image base, image is the, is the technical term for the executable. So the executable file is the image, and the executable said that it was supposed to be loaded at one, zero x one, and then a bunch of zeros. But that conflicted with some other thing that was loaded in memory, and so it really got loaded at, and then you see the base, and you'll see 0x1c, a bunch of zeros, and 0x126, and a bunch of zeros. Notice that this number does not match this number. Whenever those two numbers don't match, it means it's been relocated, and Process Explorer highlights it in yellow. All of the other, all of the other ones that you can actually read the value out of, match. It's so all the Microsoft Corporation ones. You can see that they've all been based at, at different values that don't conflict with each other, and so they get loaded in the memory in that location. You're going to see things that have an image base set to all zeros. That's really annoying, if you ask me. Um, it basically means that these things, this MUI file, is probably not actual an actual executable. What I think that it should, I think Process Explorer shouldn't tell you that it was based at zero, I think it should show it in like you know, n, n slash a, not, not applicable or something like that. Because it doesn't, image base doesn't really mean anything when you're not loading an executable. So you can map anything into a process address. You so see, you can, you can map a JPEG image file or whatever, you know, into a process. And so it, that is not an executable, it doesn't necessarily have an image base. Um, and so the relocation doesn't really mean as much. Um, so this, Looking at the DLLs that are loaded into a process is, is useful. The other useful thing is if you if you double click on a process, so I'm double click on explorer.exe here, you're gonna get a, a additional panel that comes up. There's a tab called threads. And this is all of the all of the in, independent things that are executing within this process address space. And so you can sort by start address by clicking on the start address at the top. And so you can see, like, the shell wacky DLL has multiple threads running that are all started at the same location. The plus 0x87 is the, is the offset from their base within loaded in memory. Um, and so it has multiple identical threads running. And then you see the OLE32 has a thread, and NTDLL has a thread, and MS Visual CRT, the, the runtime, has a thread. And you see, explore.exe <coughs> has one thread running. The, the, the explore.exe that got you know run on the system only has one execution point. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff inside of it that is also executing. And this is just part of the, the normal functioning of, of Windows. And so you can double click on Process Explorer, and you can look at the threads for Process Explorer. Now, Process Explorer has a whole bunch of threads. It has worker threads that handle all sorts of stuff. And so you can see a whole bunch of threads running inside of Process Explorer. And also, if a thread gets spawned, it'll show in green. And if a thread goes away, it'll show in red. And so Process Explorer is a threaded application, and it, it does a lot of work with threads. Um, and see, so you can see that here. Now, the only thing I've talked about so far are processes that are running essentially in user space on the system. There are also kernel processes. This is essentially operating system level processes. They don't have the same memory model that I diagrammed on the board. Um, they're, think drivers, you know, your video card driver, your driver for handling hardware devices and that sort of thing. They all, all drivers on the system, all, all drivers in the kernel, all share one address space. And not only that, but when a thread makes a mistake, when a thread in running our process makes a mistake, that process crashes and that process gets closed. When any driver or any thread running inside the kernel crashes, 
the whole kernel goes down and you get a blue screen. So whenever whenever you see a blue screen of death, that means that the kernel crashed, um, which is sort of different than a process crashing, which you're just getting, this, this process was terminated unexpectedly. Do you want to send an error report to Microsoft? Do you want to troubleshoot with Microsoft or anything, something like that? Um, so when you see a blue screen, it means that your kernel crashed. And so programming for the kernel is one of the hardest things that you could do. Um, you can't do like normal memory allocation. So if you've ever written a program before um, and you've ever like called malloc to allocate memory on the heap and then use memory, you can't do that inside of the kernel. You don't have the same memory management capabilities that you would have in a normal process. Um, so there is no like simple malloc to allocate memory or free to free up memory. So programming for the kernel is a, a pretty challenging thing. And so most malware authors write as little kernel code as they possibly can, just as few lines of kernel code as they can, just to get the privilege, the, the privileges that are bestowed on the kernel. And then they do everything else that they can inside of uh, inside of processes that are running not inside of the kernel space. Because they don't want to have to deal with um, they don't want to have to deal with all the different service packs and, and all of the different languages and everything like that that really matter um, for the kernel. Plus, they don't, every time they crash, they don't want to blue screen the machine, especially when they're developing the code. So they, they typically write as little kernel code as possible just to get access to everything on the system. And then they use that code to inject or take advantage of all of the rest of the system. So when we see things like you know, Explorer is running as the other PC backslash user, and we see that you know some of these SPC hosts are running like NT Authority System or you know or NT Authority Local Service or NT Authority Network Service. These are all privilege levels. These are all users on the system. And so you know local the NT Authority backslash System user has permission to do almost everything. Um, you know the the other other dash PC dash this backslash user has some permission. You know it, it doesn't necessarily have permission to to kill a NT authority system processor or, or to inject code. In or, but there is no such thing as permission inside of the Windows kernel. If you're running in the kernel, you just can do anything. And there are no permission checks. Um, there's no, nothing's there to stop you. And so if, if you can run your code in the kernel, you can do anything on the system that you want and nothing is going to stop you. And so that's the, the, the tools, um, if you ever used ISORG, Gmer, or um, Zooter, or Toluca, or Arcan Hooker, or any of these anti-rootkit tools, the way that they're able to do everything that they want to do is that they load into the kernel. So let me show you, in Windows, the system process, the process name system, that I believe has a PID of four, I think. I think it has a PID of four. Scroll over here. Yeah, the PID of four. It's not really a real process. This is sort of the process that Windows exposes that summarizes everything that's running inside the kernel. So when you click on system, you're actually looking at sort of the kernel address space and you're looking at all of the stuff that's loaded into the kernel. Notice that almost all of the kernel stuff is all .sys. These are, they're, they're essentially DLL files, but they're designed to run inside the kernel, so they have a different extension. They're also PE executable files. Um, and so if you, you don't click on the system and you go to threads, you're going to see a whole bunch of, you see here like NT, NT kernel MLPA, I don't know what MLPA stands for, but um, you'll, you see a bunch of threads that are associated with the kernel. So if you have like an NVIDIA card installed, you're going to see some NVIDIA drivers. Um, you're going to, if you know, Every bit of hardware that you have installed on the machine that has a, a driver, you're going to see that driver loaded into memory. So we'll see like LSI <coughs> Corporation, LSI Fusion MTD, this SCSI driver. This is this is the VMware um, hard drive SCSI, SCSI driver that gets exposed to the operating system. Here's the driver for it. And you'll see this NPF, N NPF stands for Network Packet Filter Kernel Driver from Case Technologies. I installed uh, Wireshark on this machine and Wireshark installed a packet capture filter because Wireshark does not, from user space, you know, from, from the normal processes, doesn't have the ability to read packets off the wire. Um, there is no interface exposed to user space to do that. And so if you want to do something that Windows doesn't support or doesn't give you the option of doing, 
you write a driver for it, you put the driver in the kernel, and you do whatever the heck you want. And so that's exactly what Wireshark did. So they put a packet capture driver into the kernel. And then they can get the packets off the wire, and there's nothing to stop them. There's nothing to stop them from doing it. You see the storage filter driver from an AMD advanced micro devices. You'll see the serial kernel debugger. You'll see the hardware abstraction layer. You'll see a whole bunch of things that are associated with running the Windows kernel. Um, it is the ultimate goal of malware to run in the kernel. If it wants, if you want to be a rootkit and you want to hide registry keys, hide processes, if you want to be able to do anything that you want, you want to run in the kernel. And the benefit of running in the kernel is no one can stop you from doing it. So once you're running in the kernel, you can't really stop it. Um, it can do whatever the heck it wants. And so in the Windows XP days, people had figured out the Windows XP kernel so well and so much um, support code had already been written. So essentially, if you wanted to write a rootkit for Windows XP, you could go to rootkit.com, which was, was a, um, a forum with researchers and malware authors and a bunch of people sharing information. You could copy and paste bits of C code to do the hooks, to do the loading, to do anything that you wanted so that all the difficulty of writing for the Windows kernel was sort of abstracted away by code that people had already written. You just filled in some of the details. You just wrote some of the glue code to bring it together. <coughs> you can have a really basic driver that all it would do is, you know, provide your malware a function of all, you know, hey kernel driver, do this for me, and it would go and do it for you so that you didn't have to run into any, you didn't have any permission issues, you didn't have to worry about any permissions or anything like that. Microsoft changed the kernel a whole bunch. Um, they changed all the offsets. They changed how some of the processes were scheduled, they, they changed how some of the memory was laid out, they changed how the heap worked, they changed a whole bunch of things. And so all the stuff that works for the Windows XP kernel essentially didn't really work for the Windows 7 kernel. It didn't really work for the Vista kernel either. It's basically the same thing. Windows 7 and Vista, their the kernels are identical. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why a whole bunch of drivers had to be rewritten. So if you had some hardware that worked on Windows XP, you had to wait for the manufacturer to support Windows 7 because they had to rewrite their driver to support the new Windows driver model. Um, Microsoft changed a bunch of the kernel APIs. They, they, they changed a bunch of the kernel objects and the way the kernel's laid out. That also affected malware authors. So all the rootkits that worked on Windows XP essentially did not work in Windows 7. And it has, for some reason I, that I don't really understand, it has taken it has taken malware off a really long time to get up to speed. So most Windows 7 malware does not attack the kernel anymore. One of the reasons is that in, in Windows XP, when you were an administrator and you double clicked on something, you essentially had you as a normal user had permission to run something into the kernel. And then once you ran into the kernel, you had permission to do anything you wanted. With UAC and Windows 7, when you double click on something, you don't have permission to run something in the kernel. And you have to wait for that UAC prompt to actually get something into the kernel. And so I think Microsoft completely changed the kernel so that existing code didn't work, combined with the additional layer of security that you had to go through before you could even get into the kernel. Made now <laughs> the say, well, you know, we don't really need to be in the kernel. We just need to run in a, in a way that people aren't going to notice and they're, are, you know, they're not going to notice us and we'll just hide. And so most Windows 7 malware just runs as your user, whereas most Windows XP malware ran as the system or at, at, in the kernel. Um, and so it has changed, it has sort of changed the, the malware landscape a little bit. In some ways, it's made our job a lot easier, and in other ways, it's made it harder because we still have to we have to deal with UAC ourselves, and some of the really powerful tools that we had, such as Isoria, such as Gmer, such as Zooter, Toluca, Artan Hooker, a bunch of anti-rootkit tools that they themselves ran in the Windows XP kernel and would give you access to a bunch of stuff. They don't work in Windows 7 because it's not really very fun to program for Windows 7, and so the malware, the, the anti-rootkit folks that write these tools, they just sort of lose their motivation. And so basically the only the only folks that have like good anti-rootkit tools that run in the Windows the Windows 7 kernel are the antivirus vendors themselves and they're trying to sell you a product that they're you know they're not necessarily selling you a useful tool that's gonna give you good access. They're just gonna sell you some automated hit or scan and let it do its magic sort of thing. So um, yeah, I think I have some more time. So I want to show you, let me show you the registry here. Okay, well, let me, before I show you the registry, let's go to the, let's go to the device manager. So I right-clicked on my computer to, and chose manage. 
and then I'm going to go to Device Manager here. Then we go to View. I'm going to show Hidden Devices. That's basically going to show everything. This is what Windows calls drivers. Um, so if you click on like non-plug and play, non plug and play drivers, and you go to something like the TCP, you go to something like the TCP IP protocol driver, and you go to driver, see a service, TC, service name TCP IP, display name TCP IP protocol driver. Um, so Notice that there's sort of a naming, uh, naming inconsistency here. What is this calling these drivers, but when you actually go, it says service name, TCP IP. And you're probably familiar with the services in Windows. So if you get a services.msc, you know that these are services. And so you see something like, you double click on one, you'll see like service name, display name, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> In Windows, Microsoft does not make a hard distinction between what is a service and what is a driver. Um, the only thing that changes something from being a service to a driver is a little flag. So let me show you where these are located in the registry. I'm going reg edit. So I'm going to collapse everything. So I'm going to go to HQ Local Machine, then I'm going to go to System, and I'm going to go to Current Control Set, and I'm going to go to Services. You can read it right here, Computer, HQ Local Machine, System, Current Control Set, Services. And the keys, the folder things on the left-hand side are keys. The Entries on the right hand side are called values. So when you say registry key, you, to, if you're really talking, if you're being accurate, <coughs> what I have highlighted is not a registry key. Um, the thing, I think I'm on ACPI, right? Yeah. So this is the registry key. This is some associated values with the registry key. Um, but you can see here, display name, it has a display name. The thing that defines the service name itself is the registry key. So AFD is a, uh, is a service, ALG is a service, HAP ID is a service. So all of these are services. And then you'll have the display name, Microsoft ACPI driver. You'll have the image path, that's the, that's the executable to run that, that defines the service. Um, and then the type, well, I believe one, well, I don't remember what the types are anymore. But zero and one are like drivers or something like that. And then the two and three and four, I think four means it's a service and it's disabled. Or no, I don't remember. There's some <coughs> Microsoft article, MSDN article, or, or something like that that says what the numbers are. But the only thing that make the only thing that differentiates a service from a driver is a little register key with a little value that says this is a service, this is a driver. Put this in the kernel, but don't put this in the kernel. Basically, that's the only difference. Um, and then there's a start type. Zero means um, start on boot, I believe. And it starts really early in the kernel loading. And then higher numbers mean start later. And then four means disabled, Doesn't, don't start it at all. Um, and so if we go back over to Process Explorer. So let's, let's rerun Process Explorer here. I'm going to leave everything open while I do it. So I'm looking at the ACPI driver, it's a power interface. Um, I'm looking at the ACPI driver. It is the, in system32 drivers, ACPI.sys, that's the name of the executable to run. Its start type is, is one, um, which I think means like start early on, but not quite a boot. I don't remember exactly. So we should see this driver loaded into the kernel. So if we click on system, we sort by name, 
There we go. ACPI.sys. I kept this one so it would be at the top. Um, and so ACPI.sys is loaded into the kernel because we're clicked at over on system. Um, and you'll see some information about this driver. Um, let's go to a different service. So let's go to Let's go to the DNS cache service. DNS cache, it's in the same location as ACPI, and it's in the services slash drivers section. Um, its type is set to 32, decimal 32. Um, and it starts at 2. I think 2 is set to like automatic. I think 2 means automatic. Um, you can see that the image path is set to some command. Which <coughs> path is set to SVC host minus K network service. Um, SVC host is the service host. It's an executable that it's a, just a container designed to run services inside of it. So when, if you can imagine for me drawing out the uh, um, the executable image, the actual text section for SVC host is really short. It doesn't really do anything. All it's designed to do is provide a container for a bunch of services to run inside of it. So those are DLLs that get put into its memory, and then threads that get run inside of that. And so it just provides a container where similar services uh, with you know, similar permission levels all run in one address space. And the reason Microsoft did uh, made a service host container is that Microsoft has a whole bunch of different services, and they didn't want to process for each one because there's some additional overhead for processes that you don't have for threads. So they wanted to collapse that overhead into just a series of service hosts. So that's why when you look at Process Explorer, I'm like all tab over Process Explorer here, you see a whole bunch of SVC hosts running. Um, each one is, is a different container with a different set of services running in it. And then <coughs> what, defines, what defines which service host to run in is the minus K network service, or the minus K and then the container name parameter. And then there's an additional parameter that gets passed. So then the object name and network service, there's an additional parameter that gets passed um, that will say, when you're running the service host, which DLL do you load? And I believe if you expand out, we're on the DNS cache service. If you expand out, you get parameters. There you go. So there's the extension in the service DLL. So when SVC host gets run with network service, it checks what additional parameters do I have? And he goes, oh, well, I'm getting, I'm getting the DNS extension and the DNS, DNS, RS, whatever that name is, .dl on. So it loads those and runs them as threads. And if we look over here in Process Explorer, we should be able to find, if you mouse over a service, you should see the services, uh, an SVC host, you should be able to see the services running in it. And I'm looking for the DNS cache service. There we go. Should be, well, it's going to be a different process ID for you, but for me, it's process ID 1000. So when I double click on this and I go to services, you see the DNS cache service, and then you see that, that DLL running inside of it. And so you should see a corresponding thread associated with this. Um, oh, I must need to run process this. So, I need to run Process Explorer it has um, a higher code. I have to run it with UAC first before I can see that properly. Okay, so now I'm going to go to Process ID 1000, threads, start address. Now we have a bunch of threads associated with the DNS cache service. If we go to services.exe and we stop the service, we should see all these threads go away. So let's go do that. Services, and then go to DNS client, which is the name of the service. And the reason we can tell that DNS client is the name of the service is when we go to the DNS cache and we look at parameters DNS cache screen. Should see it somewhere. Give me a second. <clears throat> I was expecting to 
see a description in here. I only see a description here. I don't know why I don't see it. <coughs> well, I'm just going to have to take my word on it. Um, when we look at the DNS client service, we'll see that the actual service name is DNS cache. And if we hit stop, if we look over in Process Explorer here, we should see we should see these DNS cache threads go away. So we'll stop this service. And see, there we go. There goes those threads. But and so let's go, let's go restart that. Hit start on it. There's nothing stopping us from. There's nothing stopping us from killing these threads ourselves. So why not? Let's just go ahead and kill a bunch of threads. Okay, so there are no longer any of those threads running in this service host. But we didn't actually unload the DLL, so if we click on SPC host and then we view uh, the DLLs that are loaded into memory here. Here we go. Still loaded into memory, it, it, and as far as Windows is concerned, the, the service is still running. It's just <coughs> not actually running anymore, so if we go over uh, we go over to service.exe, we refresh, start it. Um, and so it's pretty easy to decouple what Windows thinks is going on with what's really going on by just going and killing some threads uh, or starting some threads outside of the facilities that Windows will Windows shows you. Um, and so we're going to do this to malware quite a bit, where malware is checking to make sure that the process is running, but We've essentially lobotomized the process by killed all of the threads inside of it. And the malware still thinks that it's running, even though we've essentially taken out everything that's useful. Um, does anyone have any questions about Windows before we fire up the infected VMs and we actually go through some fixing? Has everything mostly made sense? Or do you have any burning Windows questions that you'd like to cover? Okay. So let's shut down. Uh, let's shut down this VM. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll probably spend the next 15 minutes getting the VM started making sure everyone's got all the settings right and everything like that, and then we'll take our break. Our break's coming in 15 minutes. Um, it's going to take us less than 15 to get, get our VMs running, but we'll just make a slightly longer break. So just like the Windows Lab working, um, you're going to want to open... You're going to want to open on the desktop <coughs> the Resident 2012 directory, the Windows 7 malware. It's also named Win7Base. You will need to bridge the network interface. So when you edit the virtual machine settings, you will need to network adapter. You'll need to set it to bridge. I have to set it to a different setting because this machine is set up differently. Um, and you'll want to set the CD-ROM drive to the, the res kit. This VM, I ran as much malware as I could run on it. Um, which means I ran like 400 different executables on the VM. Most of them didn't take, the machine got so bogged down that executables wouldn't actually run. Um, but basically I infected as much as I could, as much as I could possibly be infected. So it's not as, well I wish it were harder basically. I couldn't find any really terrible malware, so even though I ran a bunch of stuff on it, most of it didn't take, most of it didn't install properly, and, and there's only like one major root of the machine. 